we gather in the name of the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord be with you all. Good morning to you all on this, the third Sunday of Lent, more about which later. And a special welcome to you wherever you are, whoever you are, and we do hope and pray that you will find something of the living God in today's proceedings, this wonderful privilege of celebrating the Holy Eucharist given to us by Jesus. It's our custom here just to keep a few moments of quiet as we gather our thoughts and affections and thanking God for this opportunity to be with him. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord, who is full of compassion, and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. In the wilderness we find your grace. You love us with an everlasting love. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. There is none but you to uphold our cause. Our sin cries out and our guilt is great. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Heal us, Lord, and we shall be healed. Restore us and we shall know your joy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Now the collect and readings appointed for this third Sunday in Lent, let us pray. Eternal God, give us insight to discern your will for us, to give up what harms us, and to seek the perfection we are promised in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Christians in Corinth, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. 
Hear now the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the table, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, O Christ. Christ. In the speaking as in the hearing, may the glory be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have to confess that this section from St. John's Gospel, which Louise has just read to us, has on several occasions in my life got me into trouble. Jesus well and truly struts his stuff. A whip is made. Tables are turned over. Money changers are given a strong verbal. My father's house is being turned into a marketplace. Get out of here. Fast forward 2,000 years and more, and what do we see? If we look carefully, or even not so carefully, we could see many parts of our own national church adopting business values and practices, seemingly putting money and material resources above human needs. It could be argued, and blithely keeping the dinosaur barely breathing by inventing more and more non-parochial posts. You know, the ones paid to redesign the wheel each week. Next week, I believe, it's set to be a square wheel. I hear of this with my own ears. It's no invention. The problem is, though, not my saying this, as I happen to believe it is largely true, but that the ones who are real influencers are not saying it. I would suggest they might be liable to the accusation of cowardice and fear for their own careers. They have to convince themselves that their way is the right way or else they're out of the running for preferment and that the church has to modernize whatever that means in order to grow and be transformed into something that will resemble, if we're not careful, a multinational company not doing terribly well. This passage is awkward as well, because just as the money changers and the sellers of pigeons were driven out, so we lose completely the notion much beloved, especially of Victorian hymn writers, of a gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He was and remains a revolutionary. He stood for destroying the old order and finding the real kingdom of God in its stead not with an army in civil war, as many expected and hoped in his day, but by peaceful means and the occasional glitch, as in today's gospel, when violent reaction was the order of the day. Well, not for a change. I hope you're challenged by this and even shocked, as I first was when, as a younger man, I worked out for myself why some people unfairly enjoyed more opportunities than others. And now so many seem baffled 
that the poorest in our society are suffering the worst in the pandemic, which thankfully seems to be slowing down. It's there to see if you would but use your eyes. I'm simply referring to scripture and looking for its meaning, as is my job. But if you say this, you're being political, and we're told on a regular basis that the church should not indulge in politics. I've always believed that a church that does not speak the truth to injustice and inequalities in society and, in the, and, and the lies in the highest places of government is not worthy to be called the church, the body of Christ. As Archbishop Desmond Tutu wisely noted, anyone who thinks that Christianity is not political is not reading the same Bible as I am. There can be no doubt that the price Jesus paid for his actions on that day in the Jerusalem temple was his life, principally because of his heretical st statement that he could rebuild the temple in three days. Once again, folks, we're driven, driven screaming perhaps, to the greatest question, who was and who maybe still is Jesus? The temple was the symbol of faith, large and beautiful and strong. And by suggesting that it might be destroyed, Jesus appeared to suggest that it was weak or even transient. Of course, the physical temple was indeed destroyed some years after Jesus' death. But the very idea that it was possible to destroy it was too hard for the Jewish authorities to hear. A dangerous habit, challenging authority which has turned rancid. But there's your Jesus for you, your saviour and mine. Now, I would never doubt for one moment that our church building here is beautiful and worthy of maintaining in good nick. Jesus calls us to question, however, where we put our trust, where we root our faith. And he reminds us that ultimately, we place our trust in a re living relationship with him, and not with the bricks and the stones. We are blessed, of course, by a building here that enhances the outreach of the church in this place and beyond it, and indeed is much loved. It needs no physical destruction program, just an understanding that there is more to our religion founded by Jesus than simply bricks and mortar. It's the people who continue to build it for the future. Amen.
your behalf, I now affirm the faith in these words, which you can add your amen of agreement at the end, if you so wish. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now pray for the church and for the world and give thanks to God for his loving kindness to us all. We give thanks today for the place where we worship in these days at home and wherever we may be for places that inspire us in our faith. We pray that we may all play our part in their maintenance and good order. So we pray for the church, the body of Christ, the gathering of believers, for our Archbishop Justin, for Andrew and Joe, bishops in the Diocese of Guildford, for our government, and for Her Majesty's opposition, and for all those charged with weighty decisions affecting people's lives and livelihoods, affecting people's health and well-being. And we think especially about all who have worked and continue to work in the front line in the National Health Service. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We will know of people who are undergoing difficult times, those dealing with ill health and bereavement, family difficulty, anxieties. We pray that they will have a deeper understanding of God's presence with them, that they will find inner strength in him and renewed hope in Jesus. We pray especially for Tim Crowther today, who is poorly. We also remember those who have died, whose lives have touched our own and whose memory we honor. Recently departed, we pray for the repose of the souls of Helen Kersey and Klaus Tribus. Also for those who are in the year's mind this week, Gwendolyn Nichols, Madeline Mason Phipps, Tanya Pond, Dimp Balcom, and David Banton. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. So we rejoice that we are not alone that all of God's angels and saints join with us in this offering of praise and sacrifice and thanksgiving. And we ask of God that he will give to us, as he gives to all his saints, a share in his kingdom and the great vision of his glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
we proclaim Christ crucified, who by his weakness is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to set before you which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of our salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here, his spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, almighty God and everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ your Son. For in these 40 days you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline, we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer, and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to, the, to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendor of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice will be seen in all the earth. 
Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with our Blessed Lady Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, Saint James, Saint Pio and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Please bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. God's mighty saints pray for you. His angels and archangels keep their solemn vigil over you. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and those you love and care for this day forever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.